So I'd like to introduce Professor Ed Jesudason next. Um, Ed, am I allowed to say what you're doing now or not? Yeah. Okay, fine. So Professor Ed Jesudason is currently working as a junior doctor in rehab medicine. He is actually an eminent surgeon, internationally known, uh, has won international prizes for his surgery, has uh, been widely acclaimed for his research. He's a very fine pediatric surgeon. And the question you may want to ask yourselves is why is somebody with that record now working as a junior doctor in rehab medicine? And the answer to that question really is that he blew the whistle and his career was destroyed uh, and he lost a great deal as a result of that. His story is actually fascinating. I don't know how much you'll be able to go into detail, but you can find out a lot about it if you read up. So Phil Hammond in Private Eye has reported widely on his story. Um, and it involves the CQC, it involves uh, Alder Hay Hospital, it involves children dying, it involves procedures being carried out without consent, and it involves issues about racial discrimination, it involves a report carried out by the Royal College of Surgeons which is being kept secret from everybody. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Prof. Jesuday's staff speaker. Thank you. I'd like to thank Musa um, in particular, but for the rest of the team for putting this together, and also thank you for uh, coming to listen. Um, Musa's touched on some of the issues that arose in my case, and obviously within 10 minutes I can't hope to cover all that ground. But what I do want to do is, is just give um, an idea that we could talk about later. Before I get into that, I just wanted to give a conflict of interest statement, just to say that I've had relationships with these various organisations, um, extensive uh, research positions and surgery positions, whistleblowing with Alder Hay and litigation with Alder Hay and the BMA. Um, just to update, Musa, I actually got my um, final outcome six in my rehabilitation medicine training, so I've just... Just applied for my CCT, um, so I've emailed that off and let's hope the GMC deal with that swiftly. So, what I mean by the alchemy of harm is, is trying to think about how the NHS can sometimes turn harm into money. And Bob's mentioned money, Alison's mentioned money. It is something that does seem to drive a lot of the discourse around health. And harm is at the core of health. Um, it's the related concepts, and so we want to think about how that happens. I was thinking about many ways to try and summarise my case to try and illustrate that, but actually, last week, uh, this illustration proved much more powerful, and this is the account of one of the family members from uh, the Gospel Victims. And I'm going to read it out, actually. Uh, this is Bridget Reeves, the granddaughter of a Gospel Victim on BBC Radio 4 on the 20th of June. It is very, very difficult because you have to say so strong. We're not talking about an argument with just a lay person. You're talking about fighting the government. I mean, going to the point, I mean, how many letters we've even written to the Attorney General. You're talking about standing up at an inquest with no legal representation and trying to make sure that justice is done by your relative. And you're not just being closed down by somebody on the street. These are the people you've gone to and you've trusted in to give you your answers and they've let you down. And not only have they let you down, but they've manipulated evidence and they've chosen not to be honest. And we haven't got justice today. We've literally just got some kind of honesty at last. And that captures actually, I think for many whistleblowers, for many families, one of the problems that the NHS has faced. We're great supporters of it, but it's responsible also for great harm. And when that harm occurs, most family members, most whistleblowers, think of the problem in this way. The harm should lead on to an investigation uh, and, where necessary, reform. So we've got a fairly simplistic view of the situation. However, the harm is under the responsibility of an NHS organisation. And that's what we often fail to see. That effectively when the state is responsible for the death of a child, for the abuse of a child, for the premature death of elderly patients, it responds 
in a whole system way. And that whole system is organised around two key professions, the medical profession and the legal profession, who enjoy their privileges uh, at the behest of the government, and regulators who are organised around those as well. So what Bridget Reeves was saying there was entirely right, and it's come from 20 years of her family trying to understand this problem. When you report a serious issue within the NHS, you're taking on the government. And what the whistleblower isn't aware of at this time, thinking merely about the stuff in the red, is that actually there's a well-worn whistleblower pathway, and none of it ends well. So for the trust, the costly one is litigation. Do various things to them until they take you into the tribunal. At that point, you can smash them because they won't have the resources to do anything about it. Even better, if you can get them into the high court, you can get your costs back from them, so that's perfect. If you're running short of money, or imagination, or anything else, you can take them through the regulatory process, which is lower cost, but again may need them, leave them needing uh, legal support and not having the money to do it. What you'll notice is neither of these pathways lead to any inquiry into what actually happened and any reform that would benefit patients. So lots of money comes out of the NHS at this point, spent on lawyers, but not spent on reform or inquisition. And the family pathway is not too dissimilar, so the family are confronted with a, a, a daunting choice, which is either drop it, or you can go into civil litigation, which is the clinical negligence arena, and again, that gets resolved with money, not with a, a reform or real change, it's just money. The criminal pathway we heard about from James, which is the pathway that Hadiza was taken down, and that doesn't end up with money, it ends up with fines for an institution or years of suspended sentence. Again, there's no reform, no learning. And the only potential way that learning comes from these is if there's a proper investigation of the death. And that investigation is actually under the behest of the organisation that's responsible. And so the quality of those, the Williams Review has pointed out, is extremely variable. And that's where, um, in the Williams Review, they point out the quote from an organisation with a memory fully 18 years ago points out those investigations are, were bad, not good enough, and they're resistant to change. And so that's a real problem. And the Williams Review also points out that the coronial system doesn't really work very well. There's real um, variability in what gets reported to the coroner and a real variability in what the coroner does with that information. And we know from the Gosford Inquiry Report that the coroner's investigation is actually quite closely um, managed in some ways, or there's close communication between different parties. So it's not an um, overtly independent thing at all times. And then, of course, we've got the media. And the media come in for stick and praise, but it's worth pointing out that for both the hyponatremia inquiry and for the gospel inquiry, both Justice O'Hara and Bishop Jones specifically mentioned in the report, praised the media for the fact that they often persisted where everyone else stood down. They often got it right years before everyone else did. So when we're talking about trial by media, let's just be careful that the media is also one of the pillars of our freedoms. So let's talk about harm then, and how this gets turned into money. And I'm not a prude about harm. I mean, healthcare is harm. Surgery is harm. This was the Last operation I did uh, on UK soil, and this was a child, a colleague's child, who had a, um, a benign tumour going from the skull base down to the aortic arch, um, interfering with feeding and swallowing. And any such operation carries great risk. So there's the component towards the base of skull, but you see it surrounding the brachial plexus, the vertebral artery here, and the component down in the chest leading down towards the aorta. And so any of those could be associated with catastrophic harm. And the key to this wasn't surgery, it was consent. The key to this was consent, was actually a proper discussion with the family, uh, explaining all the different risks and the possible negative outcomes of which there were several. But ultimately, we were able to successfully remove the tumour through a trapdoor incision on the side of the neck and the chest and excise that 
funny looking thing there that you see at the far end. And the reason I mention that is that this was the last case I did before I left the UK. And I want to talk about the next case who was operated on Penalda Hay. Before leaving, I'd had specific meetings with the medical director to say, look, this is, uh, there's some important operating that needs done, it carries risks, it needs to be done in the right way. And this is the medical director writing back to me, talking about that paediatric tumour surgery, surgery service, and emphasising that we're not going to go, when I leave, to a single surgeon model for safety reasons. Um, the next patient who comes in for a tumour operation, after the one that I've shown you before, the next patient is this patient. And this patient died. They were operated on by a lone consultant who had returned from several months off sick leave, who hadn't been properly back to work yet, who wasn't supervised. They had put in none of the governance arrangements that we'd requested or agreed. And the issue here is that that consultant isn't, I think, to blame. The problem is the whole culture was not one of listening or thinking about the potential hazards and the potential risks. But when you report this, sorry, the, what happened in this case is the artery to the kidney, which should have been ligated, was divided, but also the superior mesenteric and the celiac axis, which meant that the gut was rendered ischemic and the child died without regaining consciousness. Um, and, and uh, you know, it could have been prevented had there been proper governance in place, a experienced consultant supporting the consultant who's returning, and fundamentally, people just listening. So this is how harm becomes money. Whistleblowers think they're talking about safety, pretty soon they're talking about their careers and they're talking about money. And this is a quote that may be familiar to a number of you, but this was Alder Hayes' training programme director on reading one of my protected disclosures. And again, I'll read it. The allegations of patient harm go beyond the cases mentioned in this document, so we can expect more damaging revelations. Alder Hay Children's Hospital is a bigger organisation than the Department of Paediatric Surgery. We in that department and senior managers within the organisation must all accept a measure of responsibility for getting ourselves into what can only be described as a major crisis. There are only two possible outcomes. Major departmental restructuring on the quiet, with Josie Dayson returning in triumph to a position of unfettered leadership, or a very dirty fight fully in the public eye, with the organisation's chief weapon being to bring Josie Dayson, who remains a talented surgeon and researcher, before the GMC for sanction. I think he has the old age children's hospital organisation over a barrel. Training program director, consultant surgeon Alder Hay. So just consider for a moment, if I had been a witness to a uh, unlawful killing, a murder, and someone had taken it upon themselves at that point to decide to use whatever means, a regulator or whatever means, to do me down, there would be justifiably an outcry, and in certain circumstances that would be a criminal offence. This has led to absolutely nothing. It signifies a culture that's wholly wrong, and we should condemn it. And it didn't stop there. This is the Alder Hay medical director, another of the paediatric surgeons, here now turning his eye towards Phil Hammond, who, through private eye, had um, raised a number of concerns about Alder Hay's conduct. And what he's saying is, thanks. I think the first priority is the poster. This was a poster of the concerns that was being presented at the meeting. Then we'll turn our attention to Dr. Hammond, GMC number, and I won't read Phil's GMC number out, but again, this is now not just targeting a witness, this is targeting a member of the British Free Press, just by dint of the fact that they're a doctor. Again, by a member of the medical profession, a BMA place of work representative, no less, and in fact, a responsible officer acting on behalf of the GMC. So there is a problem at the heart of our organisations, and not all of it is managers, and not all of it is politicians, and we as a profession need to say something about that. So, this is the transformation of harm into money. This is the, along the top here is 10 years from 2009 till 2019. Here in this first column is the whistleblowing. The next one is the years in which I've had litigation against Alder Hay, years in which I've had litigation against the BMA, 
years in which I've been investigated by the GMC, years in which I've had litigation at the University of Liverpool trying to get rid of me, years where I've had no house, years I've been divorced, and years I've been working as a junior doctor. So we know that GMC investigation on its own is a um, risk factor for suicide amongst doctors who are under investigation. As you can see there, I've had a few, to put it mildly, lean years. Um, and it's been incredibly difficult. But you can see, most importantly, that in terms of the reviews of the con concerns, we had a three-day review here. Some of the paper-based reviews of low quality there. But there's been absolutely no real investigation. And as Musa said, the main report, the Royal College report, 50% of it is redacted for that reason. So all that money, because remember all that red represents financial loss for me, but also you know, emotional loss. But also there are lawyers being employed by the NHS trusts to pursue these cases in this way. And this is the report Musa mentioned. Um, a UK judge in the employment tribunal was prepared to make the finding at the top. The report was thorough and dealt with all the claimant's concerns. Having refused to read the bits behind the blanks. So they've made that conclusion having read 50% of the report. Well, if I gave someone an all clear on reading half their CT scan, I think people would at least raise an eyebrow. I, don't, I just don't comprehend how a judge manages to find that. So we come to the money. When all this was going on, and I ended up in litigation against the trust, um, supposedly supported by the BMA, I now know the BMA were running a case against me on behalf of my colleagues, but this was the starting offer for the trust on the 4th of December 2012 to pay me not to work there until the 31st of March 2014. Now the advantage of becoming a ghost worker is that that sum of money doesn't have to be declared to the Treasury as a lump sum payment. And so I would go away, I'd be paid, but the people of Britain wouldn't actually have a paediatric surgeon doing a job. They'd just be paying. Okay. So that was the opening offer, and that was combined with the fact it would need to be tied up in a nice compromise agreement. Um, as is the way of these things, on the brink of trial, the BMA lawyers proposed a counter-offer, which was to up the ante to 36 months. We actually now know from other documents that communication behind the scenes via the BMA showed the hospital were prepared to go to two years without argument. But again, money, agreement, but no issue around safety. So safety has now disappeared. We're now in the money zone. And continuing that, um, this was a discussion I had with my lawyers. So as part of the litigation that BMA has taken against me, they've released all my privileged conversations with my lawyers. So if you think Hadiza had it hard having a reflective notes released, they've released all of that. And in that, I'm apologising here because one of the things I've done is I've released documents that came into my possession showing mental health slurs against a colleague, a fellow whistleblower that had been hidden from him and his employment tribunal. And I've released those to the press. So I apologise to the law. I said, apologise. Gagging, very common part towards end of litigation. Didn't want to allow info to be gagged out of existence. The lawyer acting for the BMA says, common part of any settlement, not just whistleblowing. So publicly, the BMA is saying we don't do gagging. Publicly, the government is saying gagging is illegal. In effect, what the law is conceding is that there are forms of words and ways around this, for example, getting you to destroy documents that make gagging a de facto um, fact. So, as a result of that release of documents to the media, things didn't go well, if fair to say. Um, and in the end, the BMA brought its own case against me for costs, which has run from 2013. Uh, it knew I was at a pretty low ebb at the end of 2012, having lost my surgical career. Uh, and within four weeks, four or five weeks, were bringing this claim against me. Um, they've, they've won. Um, 
I don't agree with the decision. I think also I unearthed a lot of documents I can't go into here that show the BMA's conflicts of interest, which were never declared to me up front. But anyway, this is the bill so far. So that's 190,000 um, straight up. And this is the um, estimated bill for the BMA recovering that 190,000. So they're saying to get, remember the 190,000 is 170 plus VAT plus interest. So 170 was the original ask. They've estimated it would take them 180 to get it back. Now this is back in October 2014, that cost will have gone up. And because it excludes VAT and any cost recovery, that's going to be closer to 250,000. So they know someone's lost their job, they've had to pay out the trust, they're not in a position necessarily to earn at the level they once did. And they've continued this case, which any commercial lawyer will tell you has no commercial credibility, has no reason to do this for a financial point of view. So there's another reason, and we have to work out what that is. What I can prove is it isn't that the BMA wanted its money for its members. Mm. I have, without prejudice documents, that I can prove with the BMA's consent and release to show that they, that wasn't the issue. So there's something else going on. Anyway, I've probably run over time, but I just want to reflect back on the fact that in terms of safety, in terms of harm, over 10 years, we've had just 50% of a three-day review by the Royal College of Surgeons. That's the sum of it. If you look at calculating the cost of the Gosport inquiry and the number of deaths they dealt with, those costs that I've talked you through, and considering the trust's cost also, which have been massive, they could probably, I reckon, have covered a full inquiry into 30 of the deaths, or 30 cases of harm. And so, it's on that basis I make the proposition that the NHS does at times work as a system that's adapted for turning harm into money rather than learning. And let's remember that money goes to law firms in big cities like this, Birmingham, Manchester, who are doing very well out of the NHS budget. They're actually setting up new departments focused around whistleblowing, focused around health. So more of that money that Paul and Alison talks about go into unseen hands because they'll say, well, it's all privilege. We can't tell you how that came to be. It's all under privilege. So it's a problem.